We are uh, continuing the series called uh, Infinitely More and uh, following the footsteps of Jesus, taking a look at uh, really launching out of a series that we were in for several weeks on times of preparation on that now before the go, right? And if you are able to align yourself into God's will, if you're able to see God clearly, prepare yourself, submit yourself, and be in that place where you are usable, then all of a sudden the life of Jesus becomes an incredible pattern, an incredible example of what we could experience, the kind of infinitely more that God has in mind. And so uh, we're continuing the series based off of Ephesians chapter three, verse 20. It says, now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within you, uh, within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Infinitely more than we might ask Think. So this morning, um, the title that uh, we, we're, uh, we're pulling uh, these resources from, uh, these, uh, the Assemblies of God, and uh, so they've kind of laid out the, the, uh, the roadmap, the series that we're in, and uh, they've, they've got this title as Hold the Line. Um, I'm going to let you guys figure out a better title uh, by the time we get to the end of this thing. And, uh, but it's is very much tied to this, uh, this concept of holding the line, idea of a standard, where is your standard, your standard of life? Where is your, uh, and the word I really like is confidence. Where's your confidence? Life is built off of something. Your confidence is in something. And the thing about standards, the key to a standard is that it isn't adjustable. All right, when it's a standard, it stays. All right, so standards can't be adjustable. So what standard are you living your life according to? And that's kind of the big question because every single one of us is. Uh, for some of us, we are the standard. Our emotional situation is our standard, right? God has a standard. Culture has a standard. There's a lot of standards that are out there. And if your standard is shifting, then that is your standard. And a shifting standard is, um, well, I saw a, uh, saw a picture of someone who parked on the beach um, below the tide line. And when the tide went back out, the sand was up over the hood of the car because the weight of the car and shifting sand is not a great recipe for a parking space. It is for a permanent parking space, but uh, not for a party on the beach. Standards cannot be adjustable. If they are adjustable, then as James says, we are as unsure as if we were standing on waves, right? Right? cannot be adjustable. And Jesus addresses this very early on in his ministry. You guys heard about the uh, Sermon on the Mount? Does that sound familiar? Right? A lot of teaching packed into this moment where Jesus takes a crowd up to a mountaintop, along a mountainside, outdoors, and he talks to them. And he talks to them about life. And he talks to them about real standards. All right? He talks to them about the rules of God, the standards of God, what can produce confidence in a life. And he, the Sermon on the Mount, it kicks off with something called the Beatitudes, right? Probably a familiar word to, uh, to a lot of us. And the Beatitudes break a lot of rules. The Beatitudes are very unexpected. And so I, I want to take a look at, for just a moment, the bookends of the, the Sermon on the Mount, and really, just, just in passing, uh, we need to come back and we'll, we'll do a series on the Beatitudes. We need to dive into these things. The point of this morning is to not talk, our, our point is not to talk about how uh, the specifics of how God's logic breaks all our rules. We don't wanna, I don't want to dive into the specifics of what the standards are this morning because there's, there's a decision that has to happen first. If we are waiting to find out what the standards are before we agree with them, then all of a sudden they become adjustable. All right, so the thing that needs to happen first is you've got to pick your standard and then you can figure out what it is. Do you want to measure the building by feet or meters? Don't just get in there and then figure out which number you like better. Okay, right, so we, what you have to do, the first step is to pick a standard and that's what we're talking about this morning. We come into the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five, right? And kicking right into the beginning is this opening into this into this. Uh, this talk that Jesus gives where he just begins to 
just deal with so much practicality of life, right? I want to read through these Beatitudes real quick. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The wisdom of God, this is just kind of the entrance into this, but the wisdom of God oftentimes defies our logic. But here's the thing, right? You cannot, you cannot have an infinite life based on finite thinking. You cannot have infinitely more if you have, can figure it out with your brain. All right, so it should, we should expect, it should concern us if we understand everything that God says, if everything, if, if God gives us all the rules and he just kind of goes to Barnes and Noble, grabs a leadership book and says, here you go, that they, they already got it here and hands it to us. And so we figure out everything that we know makes sense. That does not lead to infinite anything, right? We cannot build an infinite life on finite thinking. We cannot build a God-sized life on man-sized thinking. It does not work. So we have to expect that there's going to be some confusion. We have to expect that there's going to be some faith steps where we step out and say, this makes absolutely no sense. You know, everything in me says I should say this to them. Everything in me says that I should post this. And yet something inside of me is telling me not to, to do this. In fact, to go further in this area, that I was actually moving away from. And yeah, I know just across, across this place right now, all the examples just started flowing for your own personal situation and conversations that you just came out of and, and uh, what your conversations you may be heading into this afternoon and uh, you're already prepare, preparing your replies. You know, you know, you ever talk to somebody and you know they're looking at you forming a reply? They're not really listening. They're just forming a reply. They're loading Reloading? Yeah. But Jesus opens up with this kind of, he he gets their attention. And he breaks a lot of their cultural expectations. He breaks a lot of their rules. And then he goes on and from the Beatitudes, he jumps into, he he tackles, uh, this is where we get the ideas of the imagery of salt and light. He talks about anger, adultery, divorce, uh, keeping your promises and vows, uh, revenge. He talks about loving your enemies right? Prayer and fasting. This is where we find the Lord's prayer, right? How do we pray? Uh, Money, judging, not not controversial at all, those two things, right? The golden rule comes from this, good fruit versus bad fruit. And so he's talking about a lot of life and a lot of practicum, right? A lot of the practical nature of what do you do? What does it look like to have the fruit of the spirit in your heart to follow God? And it looks very, very different. But then he comes into the grand finale, and I want to take a look at, for a moment at Matthew chapter 7, jump, to, jump ahead a couple of chapters, and he ends the Sermon on the Mount with this imagery, right? He says, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, it says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock, right? Didn't park his Jeep on sand, built his house on the rock, The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. Just real quick poll. Anybody experienced in the last couple months rain beating down on their lives, storms, hail, wind? No one? Oh, oh, there's there's a couple. There, There we go. Thought I was alone for a minute. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. 
The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash, right? Life is built according to a standard. We make, da- we make our decisions, daily decisions, built on standards. There's something we have confidence in. There's something that we are assuming is true and will continue to be true time after time after time, right? And so we make our decisions based on this. Sometimes it's built on our ability to solve problems. Sometimes it's built on a faith in God. Sometimes it's built on, well, this is what the financial market is supposed to do. Sand. It shifts a little bit out there, doesn't it? Life is built according to a standard, and that standard produces your confidence. Right now, you go back into uh, Israel's history, and God has talked about this standard time and time again. Go back to some of the prophets. Go back to Amos. And in Amos chapter 7, he refers to this building concept. And when you're talking about a foundation, you're building your house. Um, how many of you guys know foundations are kind of important? Right? We like the house part. We don't do a lot of living in the, in the, in the foundation part. But you don't get to do a lot of living in the house part if there's no good foundation. And so it's incredibly important as much as we want to jump into the house side of it. We want to jump into the, to the, to the, the side that we see, but this building concept, life is built on something. We want to just live it, but we are assuming so many things in our lives. There are so many things that we are making a decision because it's right. Or just, and it's just, we have no idea, we're not even aware how much we're basing it on because mom and dad did. Or that's what my friends are doing. Or I think I could figure that out. You know, there's, there's, there's all these things that are part of our thinking. And they're part of our foundation. And if our foundation is not built on the right thing, then our confidence is in the wrong thing. So standards produce confidence. And if we want to live confidently, don't we? I want to live confidently. So Amos chapter 7. Starting in verse 7, Amos talks about this thing called a plumb line. It says, Then he showed me another vision. I saw the Lord standing beside a wall that had been built using a plumb line. All right, for those of you that don't know, plumb line, just a weight uh, at the end of a string. And you can really, you can see what lines up true. You can hang it from like, say, for, you want to find the center of an arch. You go up, you find, find the center from the top, and you drop that plumb line down, and it will show you exactly where center is on the bottom. You can, you can stretch a string across the wall and you can see if you, if you stretch that rope or that string tight enough, you can see if the wall's moving in and out towards it. You can see if it's straight, right? There's something that is true, that is a standard, right? So that's what this plumb line is. And so there was a wall that had been built using a plumb line. He was using a plumb line to see if it was still straight, right? It had been started straight, it had been built straight, but then life happens, is it still straight now, right? I answered, uh, or uh, the Lord said to me, verse eight, Amos, what do you see? I answered, a plumb line. And the Lord replied, I will test my people with this plumb line. I will no longer ignore all their sins. The pagan shrines of your ancestors will be ruined and the temples of Israel will be destroyed. I will bring the dynasty of King Jeroboam to a sudden end. It is going to bump up against this standard and be tested, right? Isaiah got a really similar message in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 17. It says, I will test you with the measuring line of justice and the plumb line of righteousness. Since your refuge is made of lies, a hailstorm will knock it down. Since it is made of deception, a flood will sweep it away. Look at those two things, right? A measuring line of justice and a plumb line of righteousness. But what is theirs? Instead of justice and righteousness, it is lies and deception. All right, look at this pairing for just, just a minute. Justice, righteousness, lies, deception. Right, justice, um, justice, what is true? Righteousness, what is actually, in fact, right? Not, not what looks right and can be deceiving, but what, in fact, is right, what is in alignment And uh, this standard that we are saying is right and that is true, this thing that we are saying is 
what it should be. This is my life standard. It's going to be tested. And there is an actual, there's an actual standard. It's not, we're going to see if your standard is good. It's they're going to see if our standard matches the standard. All right, so there is, as we see here, there's actually a standard. There's actually something that will show what gives confidence in life. What is true, what is just, right? We all have feelings about what is just. We all have feelings about what is true. But there is a truth and there is a justice and there is something that is right from God. There is a standard in which we can have confidence, not because we figured out the standard, but because we figured out and found his standard. Does that make sense? Moving forward. That standard is going to be tested. The standard that we pick for our life is going to be tested against the standard. So we have the opportunity to have confidence if our standard matches the standard. This is going to sound really familiar when we jump over to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. Armor of God, you guys familiar with that? Now listen to this part of the armor. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 says, Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. Truth and righteousness. And what is the role of this part of the armor? What does the breastplate do? Guard your life, it guards your heart. And if you notice, um, we, we talked about this a while ago. But if you picture the breastplate, the tighter it is to you, the more in alignment you are with this breastplate of righteousness, the closer it is to you, the more protected you are. The further and more play that there has is the more target practice the devil room, has room to use. So the further we are from this standard of righteousness, the more vulnerable our heart is. You see that imagery? What is the role of the belt? The belt of truth ties the breastplate in. Not to mention giving you some place to be able to bring the sword of the spirit with you and attach that to you. But it literally, truth, if we, are, if we can be honest, if there's truth in our life that is defining our life, then we can be honest about our righteousness and our, in line, our, our alignment with the rightness of what God has said at God's standard, right? So there's this, this mix of what is in alignment with who God is, God's character, God's commands, God's instructions, and then there is truth. How close are we really? What's really going on? An honest look. And these two things together give us our standard. They give us a look at what we can build our life on and have actual confidence in. Truth, righteousness. If we pick the right standard, we can walk in confidence. All right? Now, if you back up in Ephesians, Paul, um, who wrote Ephesians, he, and as he was just talking about the armor of God, if you back up into chapter two, he gives us this amazing imagery also about building. All right? And what's really cool is that this imagery especially for, uh, for our time, what our, what our nation is experiencing, what nations across the globe are experiencing right now. This whole concept, the context of this discussion is about breaking cultural boundaries. It is about God's pursuit of the nations. It is about inclusion of every single person into the plan of God. Ephesians chapter two, verse 20. It says, together, we are his house, built on the foundation, everybody say foundation, foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. I'm going to come to that, back to that in just a moment. Verse 21, we are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple of the Lord. Verse 22, through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. You look throughout scripture, this is a common theme. You will be a light to the nations. This is the goal of God. All right, so when we're looking at blocks and groups and we're looking at building. This isn't just our life. This isn't just your life and my life. This is blocks of people groups. This is blocks of families. This is rows of generations. And so as God is building this thing together, it's not buildings, it's people. 
And so as people come into alignment with the cornerstone, who is who? Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone. Now, if you're not familiar with, with building or with this concept of cornerstones, the DNA of the entire structure is in the cornerstone. You place this block in where? The corner. Very good, class. Now, if you pick a triangle block, it's going to be a very different building than a square block. If you pick a round block, fire your builder supplier. You don't want a round block for your cornerstone, right? Square block, all right? And so measurements would be pulled as they began to lay out the foundation. Measurements would be pulled back to the cornerstone, not the stone next to it. You can get a rough idea as the stone goes along, but it says the foundation is built on the apostles and the prophets, right? And the cornerstone is Jesus, right? So you got the cornerstone Jesus, and then you got the apostles headed off this way who were with Jesus. What is, uh, come to that in a moment, apostles this way, prophets this way. Apostles, prophets, and they build this foundation built off of the cornerstone, right? The prophets were looking forward to Jesus. The apostles walked with Jesus and were telling us about Jesus. Everything centers around this man, Jesus, the pinnacle of history, the heart of the standard. Where does scripture come from? The writings of the apostles and the prophets. This is our foundation. And scripture is only scripture because it is in alignment with God. It is the voice of God. It's not because Paul had some great leadership ideas, right? It wasn't just because the prophets had access to history. It is the word of God and Jesus is the cornerstone. Everything within the Old Testament is looking forward to Jesus. Everything in the New Testament is looking back to Jesus and looking towards him coming again. The foundation of our standard of our lives that we line up against is, is coming back to scripture based on the apostles and the prophets, which is ultimately going back to Jesus. And this is the one standard. That's why the, the Bible is so incredibly valuable is it's not shifted and it's not shaped by our mood or by culture, the current culture that it's in. There is this word of God that we have access to that is not emotionally shifting. It is not a shifting standard. It is the standard. So there's this cornerstone that not only the Bible is based on, but that we are called to base our lives on. Confidence comes when our standard is the cornerstone. Confidence comes on the, confidence has to be based on the cornerstone, right? And confidence comes from communion. The cornerstone, Jesus, scripture, word of God is not some distant concept that we're trying to, you know, clamor up to and measure ourselves up against this. It is based in relationship. And so it's not just that there's this cornerstone concept that we've got to try and figure out. And there's, there's this list of rules in, in the scripture that we've got all these different, you know, ways to read and access. And it's awesome, but, but it's so hard to actually do. You know, I read the Beatitudes and my life just doesn't seem to fit that mold. So I'm going to try something else. And it doesn't come from our ability to match up ourselves to this cornerstone. God has set it up to where it becomes relational. And now life comes through communion with the cornerstone. That's what we celebrate when we take communion. Is Jesus made a way for us to not have to bend the bricks, and move and somehow ourselves by our own power, our own ability, become good enough to be part of the building. It is by grace that we are brought into being made this place where God dwells by his spirit. And Jesus, Jesus made it possible. He paid for it on the cross. 
He paid our, our debt. The promise and the covenant is alive because it was sealed by his blood. That we can now enter relationship with God based on what he has done as opposed to what we have done. So if we want confidence in this life, we want to walk with confidence, we have to align ourselves with the standard. And the way to do that, by communion. By communion with the cornerstone. To come into relationship, we come into alignment. As you guys know, we got some work to do in our lives to, to come into alignment with our actions and our attitudes, and we, we know that's a process. But we are being invited into this family. We are being invited to be this building in which God dwells by his spirit. Not by our perfection, but by, our, by, by grace. And by our communion with the cornerstone. All right? But the, here's the thing. You have to come into relationship in order to be in relationship, right? In order to have communion, there has to be connection. And in order to have connection with God, there has to be surrender. There has to be a laying down of our standard and a picking up of his. We have to st step into the Beatitudes and not figure out whether we can do it or not, but submit to them and trust God to help us do it. There is a standard, and if we want any confidence in this life at all, and if we want any confidence heading into eternity, there's one standard. And it's built on the cornerstone, Jesus. That's it. And so that's a decision as we are, as we're moving, uh, as we're moving ahead in this series and we're talking talk about some different things, as we're moving forward in our walk with Jesus, this is a constant question. Whether we've walked with Jesus for decades or right now we're, we're wrestling with this, should I surrender or not? The only way to have confidence in this life, the only way to walk in life is to, to submit to the one standard. Walk in communion with the cornerstone who is Jesus. Jesus. Aren't you thankful that he made it possible? He didn't just write out the list of demands and leave it up to us. He made it actually possible. So we're going to take communion as we, uh, as we close out this morning.